Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we delve into The Age of Empathy, a thought provoking exploration by celebrated primatologist Franz de Waal. This enlightening work challenges the notion that humans are inherently selfish and violent by presenting compelling arguments grounded in biology, history, and science that demonstrate our natural tendencies toward cooperation, peace, and empathy. As a professor at Emory University and a prominent figure in primatology, Franz de Waal brings exceptional insight to this topic. He is the author of several influential books, including Primates and Philosophers, Our Inner Ape, and Chimpanzee Politics. His prominence in the field was highlighted in 2007 when he was named one of Time magazine's 100 Most Influential People. The Age of Empathy is an essential read for anthropologists delving into the complexities of human nature. Sociologists invested in understanding our biological propensity for bonding. And students interweaving the disciplines of social science, politics, evolution, and biology. Join us as we uncover the more compassionate side of human nature and consider what it means for our society and future. The Age of Empathy, Nature's Lessons for a Kinder Society Introduction Unlock the power of human empathy and reshape your view of society. Have you ever been told that humans are inherently selfish creatures, driven by personal desire and a survival of the fittest mentality? This long-held belief paints a bleak picture of humanity, suggesting that behind every kind gesture lurks a self-serving motive. What if, however, this view neglects a fundamental part of what it truly means to be human, our inherent capacity for empathy? It's time to challenge the misconception of humanity's so-called evil nature and to look beneath the surface of our collective actions. Whether it's the compassion shown by first responders during a crisis or the nurturing care of a mother for her child, examples of human empathy are everywhere, suggesting that connection, not competition, is the key to our survival. Throughout this exploration, you'll uncover insights that may well turn your understanding of human nature on its head. Discover the truth behind ancient fortifications, dive into the evolutionary basis of herd instincts, and even unravel the secrets of long-lasting relationships. Let's embark on a journey to unravel the age of empathy and reveal the true essence of being human. Part 1. Unveiling the myth of selfishness ingrained in our perception of human nature. It's a storyline we've encountered over and over. Human beings are naturally selfish, looking out for number one at all costs. The mantra of greed becomes romanticized, turning cutthroat ambition into a celebrated trait. The famous words from the film Wall Street echo this sentiment, conveying greed as a virtue necessary for progress and survival. This pervasive belief doesn't just live in movies. It finds roots in history through the concept of social Darwinism. The brainchild of the Victorian era's Herbert Spencer, it became the anthem for the ruthless competition in life's arena, where only the strong survive. In this harsh worldview, success is a zero-sum game and altruism is for the weak. Echoes of this dog-eat-dog mentality reached into the corporate corridors of power. Business magnates like John D. Rockefeller Jr. held the notion of big companies prevailing over smaller ones as natural law in action. Such ideas paint a picture of a society where might makes right, and the quest for personal gain overshadows the collective good. This distorted picture of human nature can lead to toxic practices, as seen in the case of Enron. The Energy Corporation operated on the premise that fear and greed are the twin engines of human behavior. Their notorious rank and yank policy, where the lowest ranking employees were regularly culled, fostered a culture of distrust and cutthroat competition. Enron's business dealings were just as ruthless, with deliberate blackouts and manufactured shortages designed solely to maximize profits, regardless of the human cost. However, Hubris often heralds downfall, 
and Enron's story ended with its own collapse in 2001. Its story serves as a cautionary tale that challenges the belief that selfishness underpins human nature and the catastrophic consequences when we tilt too far into this narrative. Part 2. Re-evaluating the narrative of perpetual conflict in human history. The grand narrative of human history has often been painted with broad strokes of violence and war, suggesting an unceasing saga of conflict as the default state of our species. As Winston Churchill famously remarked, it seems as if peace has been nothing more than a fleeting respite in an otherwise endless cycle of strife. Yet is this depiction truly reflective of the entirety of the human experience? Let's delve into the annals of time and evidence to reassess this perspective. It turns out that the cradle of human civilization wasn't necessarily rocked by the constant drum of warfare. In fact, periods of peace might not have been the exception, but rather the norm, punctuated only occasionally by episodes of conflict. Take, for instance, the walls of Jericho, a biblical symbol of warfare protection. Recent archaeological interpretations challenge the military narrative, suggesting that these structures might have served as safeguards against environmental threats like mudflows, not as ramparts against human aggression. Moreover, the everyday reality for our hunter-gatherer ancestors wasn't a relentless quest for domination, but a fight for survival against the formidable forces of nature. With their small, scattered populations, perhaps the last thing on their minds was waging war against each other. Even in modern times, the mass mobilization for war is less a product of an innate thirst for violence and more a manifestation of our powerful herd instinct. Whether it's Napoleon's troops braving the Russian winter or soldiers bound for distant lands, it's not bloodlust that fuels their march, it's belonging. These individuals are propelled by the same collective impulse that unites crowds in stadiums, concert halls and prayer halls. The intrinsic human longing for unity and synchronization, not separation and destruction. When we march to the beat of a common drum, whether in joy or in battle, it is the herd instinct in action, showing its ability to mold our behavior both for war and for the sheer exhilaration of togetherness. Part 3. Herding Together. The invisible ties that link us to the animal kingdom. Imagine a world governed by an invisible force that not only prompts us to yawn in an echoing chain, but also binds us to the myriad species we share our planet with. This phenomenon isn't magic. It's the manifestation of our instinct to be part of a collective, often referred to as the herd instinct. This powerful force transcends species, connecting us in a web of shared behaviors. You've probably noticed it, even if you weren't quite sure what to call it. It's there in the ripple of yawns that pass through a room, and it reveals itself in the animal kingdom every time a troop of chimpanzees irresistibly yawn in unison after watching another chimp do the same. But the herd instinct isn't just about mimicry. It's a vital cog in the survival machinery. Picture a flock of birds soaring through the sky. Their flawless formation isn't just for show. It's a critical coordinated effort to ensure safety and navigational efficiency. Without this instinctual synchrony, any who stray could find themselves lost or in the clutches of a predator. For migratory herds, this same instinct ensures well-timed stops for food and rest during treacherous journeys often with no room for error. Everyone needs to act together to make it through. This innate synchronization does more than keep us safe. It facilitates an emotional tether between us. It's at play when we instinctively mirror our date's posture or gestures, creating a harmonious dance that draws us closer. It's the silent language of mimicry that says, I'm with you. The influence of this instinct extends even to the mundane corners of our lives, such as a diner interaction. A waiter who echoes a customer's order rather than offering a generic response can see a notable increase in gratitude or tips. As we explore further, we'll see that this instinctual bonding, this thread of collective movement and feeling, 
has implications far richer and more meaningful than mere monetary gain. It's a key part of what makes us and all living creatures inherently social beings. Part 4. The Profound Impact of Human Connection on Longevity and Contentment Imagine the crushing weight of isolation, so severe that the lack of human contact becomes a punishment even more feared than physical harm. The use of solitary confinement in prisons speaks volumes about our intrinsic need for social bonds, a need so great that its denial is deemed one of the harshest penalties by society. To view the formation of society merely as a calculated trade-off, as proposed by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his social contract theory, is to vastly underestimate the role of human interdependence throughout history. The notion that early humans sacrificed freedom for protection is speculative at best. Beyond protection, it's the deep-seated drive for connection that has always brought humans together. The benefits of companionship echo through every aspect of our well-being. Far from a simple source of contentment, our social ties are lifelines that sustain us, both heart and soul. The profound need for others can be so overwhelming that its absence can spiral into despair. The positive effects of human bonds are measurable even in the realm of physical health. Consider the institution of marriage. Statistics show that married individuals often enjoy extended lifespans compared to their single counterparts. But the connection goes deeper than mere statistics. The phenomenon of married couples growing to resemble each other is a perfect illustration of our ability to bond at the deepest levels. Researchers discovered that over 25 years of marriage, partners develop similar facial features, not because of initial physical similarity, but because of the years spent sharing emotions and experiences. Marital bliss, it seems, is inscribed in the lines of our faces, a silent testament to the power of empathy and shared life. The most joyful and communicative of partners display this transformation most vividly, their appearances merging until others can recognize their coupled harmony at a glance. This physical manifestation of the human capacity for empathy and connection serves as a clear sign that our survival and happiness are inextricably linked to the relationships we nourish. It's not just company we seek. It's the profound and life-affirming bond that comes from truly being with another person. Part 5. The Peril of Ignoring Our Fundamental Need for Empathy and Connection We like to believe that we're the masters of our fate, fully in charge of our preferences and behaviours. This belief is echoed by the concept of behaviourism, which suggests that our minds are akin to blank slates and that with the right techniques we can shape our very being. John Watson, the proponent of behaviourism, claimed his theory's victory through his infamous experiments with a young child known as Little Albert. In these experiments, Watson induced fear in Albert towards a harmless rabbit by creating a loud, frightening noise whenever the animal was present. Watson saw this as proof that through conditioning, we could override our nature. Yet Watson's deep skepticism about innate human instincts, such as maternal affection, led him down a path that had severe repercussions. One of the most chilling examples was observed in orphanages. Here, Infants spent their days in sensory deprivation, lacking both visual stimuli and the touch of a caregiver. Instead of flourishing, as behaviorism might predict, these children were emotionally and physically stunted, displaying a haunting void in their expressions. This tragedy shone a stark light on the defect in Watson's reasoning. Devoid of nurturing care, these children's immune systems faltered, leading to needless suffering and death. This barren approach underscored an incontrovertible truth. From birth, we are biologically wired for connection, nurturing, and empathy. Our mammalian roots dictate the profound impact of maternal care, so profound that its echoes can be felt throughout our lifetimes. This need for nurturing does not wane as we grow. It takes new forms. In adulthood, Our expressions of love often mirror the tenderness traditionally associated with motherhood. 
whether it's sharing food with a loved one or the soft cooing exchanges reminiscent of a mother's lullaby. It's clear that denying the essential instinct for empathy can have dire consequences, proving that nurturing is not just a maternal gesture, but a human necessity. Part 6. Empathy, the instinctual catalyst for human cooperation and survival. Consider the times you've reached out to someone in their moment of need. It's likely that your gesture came without any expectation of reward. That's because empathy, our ability to comprehend and share in another's feelings, is not a learned behavior, but an innate part of who we are. Biology and history make a compelling case that our propensity for empathy and collaboration has been pivotal to our continued existence. If our ancestors had prioritized competition and indifference, chances are we wouldn't be here to reflect on our nature. One of the clearest demonstrations of natural empathy is found in the parent-child relationship. Through the lens of 200 million years of evolution, the empathetic bond that forms between caregivers and their young has proved essential for the survival and well-being of the next generation. Empathy, thus, isn't merely an altruistic trait. It is an evolutionary imperative. It's so fundamental to our makeup that it operates beyond the reach of conscious control. This was underscored by the research of Swedish psychologists Ulf Dimberg in the 1990s. In his study, participants subconsciously mimicked the expressions of faces shown to them, happy or angry, even when flashed so fleetingly that they couldn't consciously perceive them. This involuntary response demonstrated that empathy is hardwired, reflexive, and universal to all but those who are psychologically atypical, such as psychopaths. The takeaway? Empathy is not only natural but necessary, and the narrative of an intrinsically malevolent human nature crumbles under the evidence of our genuine instinctive capacity to care for one another. Bearing this in mind, we can confidently counter any claims that paint humankind with a brush of inherent evil. Final summary. The pervasive narrative of human nature often leans towards the dark side, highlighting our supposed propensity for selfishness and conflict. However, this book turns the spotlight on a different aspect of our nature, our intrinsic empathy and tendency to care for others. We have evolved not as solitary competitive beings, but as creatures deeply wired for empathy, cooperation, and communal living. From the caring gestures we exhibit in relationships to the instinctual bonding mechanisms that connect us within the animal kingdom, our actions are often guided by an innate sense of empathy. Society might draw our attention to instances of aggression and competition, but the science of our biology reveals that empathy is a part of our survival toolkit, hardwired into our beings. As we recognize and nurture this aspect of ourselves, we begin to see that the capacity for kindness and understanding is not the exception, but the rule of human behavior. What we choose to focus on in ourselves and each other can indeed shape our collective reality. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then. Happy reading and happy listening.